This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 26 of Retired Racehorse Radio on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, Cashel Products, and Retired Racehorse Radio is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. Brought to you in cooperation with the Retired Racehorse Project and New Vocations Racehorse Adoption. Today, we go right to the track with Sophia Doyle to learn a day in her life as a professional jockey. We talk with vaulting gold medalist Carolyn Bland and Daniel James from the Pacific Coast Vaulting Team on what it takes to be a vaulter and how it could be a great second career for retired racehorses. And New Vocations brings us another fabulous Winter Circle Adoptable Horse of the Week. Stay tuned. <laughs> And they're off on Retired Racehorse Radio, the podcast that is your guide to the adoption, care, and training of the retired racehorse. This is Jamie Jennings of Norman, Oklahoma. And this is Joy Hills from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and you're listening to Retired Racehorse Radio. Well, Joy, I did something... It sounds like you adopted something else. What is it this time? <laughs> I actually adopted, as appropriately as it is for the show, a retired racehorse. I got another Woo! one. I'm, I, I love just, it. I couldn't help it. So she was, her name is a little bit Oki, and she's a 16 hand dark bay mare with a blaze. And I do a lot of training for mm-hmm. off the track thoroughbreds from a rescue. They, they send me their horses that have been standing around or may have problems or having trouble getting adopted. And this is a horse that came off the track two weeks ago, two what? weeks ago, two weeks ago. Your son and, was on this horse, right? Uh, maybe. So yeah, she came to me and immediately my husband was like, we should keep her. We should keep her. And I'm like, Dude, so good. I know he's so good, but like, he's the worst, (laughs) the worst. He's like, we should keep her. We should keep her. She's great. And so I wrote her and I mean, she came off the track two weeks ago and nothing Mm -hmm. bothers her. She's so unaffected. If you want to go to my Facebook page, just Jamie Jennings on Facebook, you can see the videos of this mare and I'll actually share them here on retired racehorse radio because she's just so chill. And he kept going, we should keep her, we should keep her, we should keep her. Because I, I train these horses and I post mm-hmm. videos and I hope that they get adopted. And I'm like, babe, we don't need another off the track third, but especially just a big old mare. You know, what are we going to do? And he just swore up and down that she was great. And I was like, if you think she's so great, you ride her. And so after I rode her, then he mm-hmm. got on her and he doesn't Aww. ride. And she was. And he awesome. felt totally comfortable with her. Yeah, as so I just kept on oh the rock in. And then I'm like, Lucas, because Lucas, my son, who's six, is like, we have to keep her. Like, you get on her. And I'm just waiting for something to happen. You know, we're there just in case yeah. something happens. And she Nothing. just super chill. Oh, and that is the unicorn horse. I, I'm like, how did this mare come off the track two weeks ago? But she was started well, raised well. She never ran in anything under an allowance race. So the, the owners were very particular. And once she was done with all of her racing, they just said, we want to retire her responsibly. And they sent her to Horse and Hound Rescue Foundation in Guthrie, Oklahoma, because they know that they're going to get a good home. So when mm-hmm. she sent this horse to me to train, she's like, you won't keep her long. She's really great. And we just need some videos of her under saddle. Little did she know. Yeah. I'm (laughs) like, Hey, um, so I found a home for her. She's like, really? What? Who? I'm like me. (laughs) So yeah. So that's so great though. A little bit. Oki is now joined the family. So I mean, today, like just today we decided to adopt her. We had the vet come out and, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, please, please tell me why I cannot have this horse. And, and she's, she's like, completely sound. She's like, Nope, she looks good. Thank you. No problem. I actually said to her, I go, can I, she was, what do you want me to do? I'm like, just make sure she's heartbeat and like, try to see if she has like, I don't know, but she seems like a robot. She's just so like, oh. you know, the vet was holding you her. You know what though? Just, I have a mare like that. my childhood pony is just like that. And I mean, it's been amazing. I have kids get on her and everything today and you just, If I had a barn full of her, it would change my life. Not even kidding. So it's a good thing to have. It's a, it's a good thing to have. And, and so to, if I was like, you know, she's only ridden on a straightaway on perfect footing. So you need to 
take her on some trail rides and see how she does. So today I'm like, this is the decision we're going to make. We're going to take her on a trail ride and see. I'm waiting for something to happen. And she know? was super chill, wasn't oh she? Oh my God, she was perfect. She was perfect. Aww. Undulating terrain, up and down hills, no problem. Just whatever. Well, I cool. can't wait to hear about what she does. You think you'll show her at all or just keep her as a family? Oh, I have to. Uh, she'd be so fun to take somewhere and do something yeah. with. I mean, obviously now she really doesn't understand what the leg means and to go mm-hmm. forward and turning is, but, but just her general demeanor is so mm-hmm. lovely that she's light years ahead of some of the other ones that I get in training who not mm-hmm. only do they have not know what those things are, but they also have other issues and she just doesn't have any other issues. Oh. And so, but the fact that my son wrote her, my husband wrote her, I'm like, Okay. She's perfect. Yep, that's a keeper. That's what so we had to. And so, yeah, when your husband says adopt a horse, you say, okay. <laughs> that's uh, what I think. Anyway. Most of the time, anyway, unless you're, yeah. he's my husband. He's like, let's get all of the ones from new vocations. I'm like, get off the internet. Yeah. Get off the internet. <laughs> Put your computer down. Put your phone away. <laughs> so yeah, a little bit okay. Joining the family. I, uh, for those keeping track at home. I also have nuisance as his race name mm-hmm. is actual our name is Drax and we have Groot. So we have Groot Drax and now Oki. So oh. welcome to the family. Oki. So fun. And with that news, let's go ahead and talk to our title sponsor, Kentucky performance products. Cause I feel like I'm be writing them a big check here soon. <laughs> <laughs> she swallowed hard as they walked into the start box She could feel his muscles tense under her leg. Five, four, three, two, one. Have a great ride. She didn't have to ask. He galloped out of the box and across the field toward their first training level course. His ears pricked. Her heart pounded. He attacked each obstacle with confidence, clearing them with room to spare. A huge smile broke out on her face as she crossed through the finish flags. She leaned forward and buried her face in his neck. Their bond of love and trust blocked out all else. This love story is brought to you by Elevate. Research proven to have superior bioavailability. Elevate supplies the essential vitamin E often missing from the equine diet. Its all-natural formula supports healthy muscle and nerve functions. The horse that matters to you matters to Kentucky Performance Products. Call 859-873-2974 or visit kppusa.com to order today. Joy, I don't know how you found her, but I'm so excited to talk to female badass jockey, Sophie Doyle. She's going to come on and tell us all about her career. Hi, Sophia. Thank you for joining us. Hi there. Good evening. Thank you for having me on today. Now, you are a badass female jockey. Let me go ahead and throw that out. But what I would like is for, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sophie Doyle and I was born in the UK in Cambridge. And my mom, Jacqueline Doyle, was a racehorse trainer and she trained for 25 years. So naturally, I was pretty much born and bred into racing and Obviously, I caught the bug very early for wanting to become a jockey. So I um, had my show ponies when I was very young, and I got to do had a, had a lot of experience with the show ponies and show jumping. And then I decided that I wanted to be a jockey at the age of 19. And as much as my mum tried to push me in the way of wanting to be <laughs> an eventer or, or a show jumper, the fact that she had a barn full of racehorses, I was like, well unless you're going to turn the racehorses into show jumpers and eventers, I think we'd better off stick to racing. It'd be a lot more easier way of doing things and definitely a lot less costly too. So that's how I got into racing and I've loved it every moment, every moment I've been in racing and throughout my whole career, it's been great. And I'm so blessed that I was born into such a wonderful racing game with the horses. I mean, you were born in a place called the Valley of the the Racehorse. Yeah, that's that's where I grew up in Lambourne. It's very well known for Valley of the Racehorse because they have a big, they have a huge big hill with a white horse that is very historical that's made out of white chalk. And I've spent many a times where I've walked up there and been up to see the site, and it's beautiful. 
and it's a great name for where all the racehorses are in Lambon that how it's very fitting that it's in the valley and it's full of racehorses. I mean, you had to have that as your your career if that's where you grew up. I mean, it just makes sense. Now, you have a family Absolutely. of people that raced in jockeys and trainers and all sorts of stuff, but you in England, but you decided to leave England and come to the US. Yes, I did. I decided back in 2013 that after a couple of trips abroad, which was out that I first ever left England and went to Dubai, and Abu Dhabi and I had two working holidays out there and then I started going for some working trips out to America where I went to Palm Meadows in Florida with Carl Nafkas and Ian Wilkes and then later on I ended up in California working for Jim Cassidy and also Steve Asmussen. So I eventually I decided that I felt like the way racing was going for me and my career, the way my career was going for me I felt like that was the right decision and you know England's very very tough it's a lot of work it's a lot of driving around the whole country day in day out and I just felt like there was a bigger opportunity for myself to come over here and you know obviously being away for a couple of years abroad through the winter it broadened my horizons of what what else is out there for me, and especially in horse racing. So after I made my way to America, I just decided that I think it's time that I make a change. And I feel like everything happens for a reason. And, you know, those trips that I had and the people that I met and the connections that I made, it put, put everything in the right in the right path for me. And, and that's how I made my decision that I thought, felt like America was the place to be. And I felt like I could make a really good career for myself over here. And so far, it's come really well. I was going to say, tell everybody how that's been working out for you. Uh, it's been very well. And finally, last year, I finally got my first grade one. and I managed with Street Band and Larry Jones. And we had a grade one, grade two, grade three, which was just astonishing. And I've written more winners than I could ever imagine I would have done if I'd have stayed back home in England. And of course, like every business in the world is that there was money to be made here. And I've been very fortunate and I've had the right horses to ride and met the right connections and had met some wonderful trainers and owners and and without doubt the racehorses. I've been fortunate enough with Street Band and of course Bioretti who gave me my first graded stake at Keeneland. So I was going to ask about Street Band is he is he kind of the horse or is Via Reddy the horse that really kind of when you think about your career, you guys, let me tell you, she's earned over eight million dollars in purses. And out of 60 starts this year, six first, eight seconds, nine thirds to two hundred and four thousand dollars. And it's February. I mean, this is amazing. You've just been very successful. Who do you think your kind of career making horse is right now so far? Um you know, it's been, I mean, between Fioretti and Street Band, the two of them were spread out between three years apart. You know, whereas the other male jockeys like Florent Giroux, the Ortiz brothers, they're constantly picking up greater stake horses. You know, it's just natural for them. For some reason, they get it. So it comes along a lot easier, whereas I've had to really work and grasp and really get pushed to get myself onto some nice horses. And I've managed to keep myself aboard Fear Ready and Street Band. You know, Fear Ready, she did wonders for most of it at the start of my career in 2015 that I was getting opportunities with her that I wasn't elsewhere with a couple of people. And of course, being in Kentucky, that it's a very tough circuit. So she really helped to mold my career at the start there. And now I'm blessed to have Street Band is racing for the second season at the top of her game. And she's keeping me alive and it's, you know, keeps that fire burning that you just can't wait to get back out there. And, you know, this year already, I knew that we had three graded stakes to aim for at the beginning of the year. We've already been to the Sam Houston Ladies Classic and ran third. And then now we've got the Azuri and the Apple Blossom coming up at Oaklawn, which are two huge races for the beginning of the year for the mares. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, you know, you just, I just keep hoping that and another one of those two will come along soon and it'd be, you know, cap off a really well done career throughout 
my whole life, really. Nine out of the top 10 earning horses that you sit on are mares or fillies. Do you think you have a better connection with the fillies or mares or has it just been luck? I think it's just, I think, I think honestly, it's just the way things have played out, really. There's plenty of colts and geldings that I get on very well with, but I've obviously just picked up a really good niche with the fillies and I had, I've had some really good people around like Sir Henry, Sir Henry Cecil who I breezed quite a few times for and I got to meet and spend time with. And one of the biggest questions that I asked him was, what do you think you're, what makes you so great with fillies? And he said to me, well, it's just like with any woman, you have to ask them, you can't tell them. (laughs) And I think that's been a, I think that's been a, a great piece of advice that I've always listened to that whenever I get on a filly, that you have to remember, it. you've got to be able to ask them. You can't keep telling these fillies and mares, you have to do it. It's You've got to ask them and encourage them. And I think we've just, I've picked up a really good reputation with them. And, you know, they've really, they've come good for me too. They've responded to my response and we've struck up some really great partnerships. And I've had, I mean, even if I had to pick between the two, I think definitely the Phillies have got so much courage and it's great to be on them. And they really, they give you your heart and soul when they're out there for you. Oh, that's so beautiful to hear. I actually, I just talked earlier. I just adopted my first off the track thoroughbred mare. I usually, oh, I just always end up with the gelding. So that's good advice for me. Mm-hmm. Don't tell her, just ask her. <laughs> that's probably mm-hmm. a better way and to then, go and Absolutely. And they'll always tell you. I feel like I've, um, there's actually not many people know that when I was back home in England, I grew up around a guy called Gary Witherford and his son, Craig Witherford. And they are both the two Monty Roberts of England of horse whispering. And I spent a lot of time with them doing a lot of horsemanship skills and learning how to listen to horses and how to respond to them. And I feel like that's, I've portrayed that throughout my whole career. And I think it's been a really big help in how to understand, you know, being on these horses. And when you're out there that I'm not, I'm not a big, strong guy. I'm a small girl and I'm able to assess them and listen to them. And I know, understand what they're telling me. And I think that's really been a big help. If you were to look at the entire history of racehorses, who is the one racehorse you just wish you could sit on past or present? I mean, if you go back far enough, you'd have to go to Desert Desert Orchid. Desert Orchid. He was just an amazing horse that I watched throughout his whole career. That just the leap that he used to take over the steeplechase fences were just absolutely incredible. And still to this day, everybody's talking about him. He's still a horse that you still see videos of, and he's just such a wonderful horse to watch. And he's just takes your breath away every time you watch him in back in it while well, watching back in his old videos. He's a horse that captured my heart right from the very beginning. Wow. So do you think that someday you want to go to, to jump racing? I've actually been, I've had thought about it. And I remember being a very young girl with a very small pony trying to jump over these big, massive um, national hunt steeplechase fences, which the pony did achieve. And I remember telling a guy called Richard Perham, that I will definitely ride the Grand National. Still to this day, I haven't rode the Grand National. And having taken a couple of spills on the flat, I think I would definitely stick to the flat racing and not go over a fence and jeopardize coming down into the ground at a a greater height than the height of a racehorse. I think I'll take speed over the height of jumping those big fences and something happening. I don't blame but you. Was, yeah. <laughs> but when I was young, I when I was young, I used to school all the time with my mum's racehorses. I schooled over the hurdles and over the steeple chase fences, teaching babies to jump. And it's great and it's wonderful. And, um, you know, if there was ever a, a flat jockey's jump race over here in America, I'm sure I'd probably put my hand up right away to do it. But as for right now, I think I'll stick to the flat, the flat racing. I think it's good because I'd like to see more of you in the future. Where can people get a hold of you and find you if they want to follow you or kind of see where your career is going, what races you have coming up? The best thing to do really is um, like 
you have the app Horse Races Now with Kenning McPeak. They here's a wonderful app that you're able to put in your own trainers, owners, horses, and jockeys. So you can put me in to um, as your favorite jockey, and you get alerts for um, entries, results. You can follow me everywhere I go, and then also, of course, on my social media side that I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and most recently I've got on TikTok. Oh boy! Because apparently, got, that's the new <laughs> that's the new thing to be on. But I'm yet to post a video because I haven't figured it out how to work it yet. <laughs> well, Joy is our resident young um, uh, entrepreneur on social media. Joy, uh, you're going to have to give us all a solid tour on TikTok, okay? Sophie, yeah. it has been an absolute pleasure having you on, and I wish you the very best. And I will follow everything you do from now on. I'm I'm officially yeah. your number one fan. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. We'll you'll be seeing next week. I'm flying out to Saudi Arabia to Riyadh to race in the International Jockeys Challenge that they're having there next Friday, the day before the Saudi Cup. Oh, fantastic. So that's going to be an amazing experience. And of course, there will be there's going to be seven female jockeys and we'll all be making history as the first female jockeys to ride in Saudi Arabia. Oh, my so God. That's going to be pretty spectacular. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Best of luck to you and all the ladies out there. That's, that's, yeah, uh, that's thank incredible. You. It'd be brilliant. So thank you very much for having me on this evening. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon, Sophie. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Cashel Company helps you enjoy the ride with their full line of trail bags and tush cushions. From kennel bags to horn bags and everything in between, comfort and convenience on the trail is what Cashel does best. To stay up to date with the latest products and news, follow Cashel Company on Facebook and Instagram. And to find their products, you can visit an authorized dealer or visit CashelCompany.com. So, Jamie, I did something kind of crazy, and I went to a vaulting clinic this last weekend. My chiropractor actually has a vaulting club at her barn in Lawrence, Michigan. <laughs> That's how she places. makes her money. That's I know. how she makes uh, her money, breaks them all, and then fixes them all. I know. Of all places in Lawrence, Michigan that no one's heard of, but highly recommend checking out Cedar Lodge Equestrian Center if you're there. But I came out, and of course, Carolyn Bland's there, who's like top notch, like at the top of the game. She's coached for the WEG team. She's a gold medalist for vaulting. And then Daniel James, who's on the Pacific Coast team as well. He competed at WEG in 2018. I'm like, you guys got to come on the show. So I'm lucky enough to have them. I would like to do a quick corrections corner too. I mentioned that uh, vaulting is part of the retired racehorse disciplines. It's actually been used in the freestyle. So small correction yes. corner there, but they can do it if anyone's interested in vaulting with a thoroughbred and Carolyn and Daniel tell us how that happened. So welcome to the show. So first question I'm going to ask and anyone can answer it. Most people don't know about vaulting on our network. It's a very foreign thing. We can see it on YouTube. We know what it looks like, but there's three things you can compete in for it. Could you do a high level overview of those competitions? Yes, actually they offer three events, which mm -hmm. is an individual. So that's just one person on the horse. Mm -hmm. And then they also offer a part to do division. Mm -hmm which is two partners on the horse. It can be a male and female or two mm -hmm. females or two males. And then they have what they call a squad, which okay. is a team of six kids. Oh, and they get on the horse and up to three can be on the horse. There are other rules about and levels mm -hmm. of how many big triples they have, but those are the, basically the three events. Oh my God. Six kids. Six kids on the yeah. squad. <laughs> up to three on the horse at any one time. I don't know how you guys manage that circus. Like you think riding is hard enough as it is. And then you guys add gymnastics and now you're adding multiple riders to it. How do you train someone to prepare for that? Well, conditioning is definitely a big part of it. Um, from the work we did today, we just had a big uh, conditioning session at the end. Mm -hmm. Kids are nice and tired now and it, and it takes a lot of work from that. It starts with the individual control. Every person needs to be responsible for their own balance in a team mm -hmm. so that they can give help and balance to others in uh, whatever moves they're doing that require, you know, two people to be connected or one lifting the other mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. So it, it takes a lot of, yeah, a lot of personal physical strength as well as balance. Mm -hmm. 
So Daniel, you know, you competed at WEG. You've kind of been doing this for a while now. What's an average day for you when you're getting ready? When you wake up in the morning to prepare for vaulting? Most days I will, I'll start my day. Um, I also do a lot of coaching. So I answer emails and do some planning in that mm-hmm. regard. But whether I'm doing that or or not, I'm, I'm often also helping Carolyn Mm -hmm. Uh, my coach and our horse trainer. I help her train up new horses for vaulting. Mm -hmm. So I often spend my mornings doing that. After that, I'll usually have uh, one of my own trainings and that's on the horse for pas de deux or for Mm -hmm. team and occasionally individuals nowadays. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoons, late afternoons is usually when I'm coaching. And then whether I get this done in the evening after that or sometimes early morning, I'll be doing some form of cross training, like going Mm -hmm. to the gym like a weightlifting gym Mm -hmm. or also a gymnasium to to practice gymnastics or just working more on the ground and the barrel on vaulting exercises. So cross training is very important. Yes. Okay. Because even in today, just watching the clinic that was here, you know, the girls, they seem to start out on the barrels here, then they move to the horses and then you have them do a plyo session at the end. And that's a lightweight training? Is that more of an introduction to kind of what a normal, if they wanted to be at your level, what that would look like? Um, I would say it just takes a lot of consistency Mm -hmm. with that. It's at least at my level, the amount Mm -hmm. of training that's required is at least a part-time job. I would say if you're not training at least 15 hours a week, you're probably not going to be improving enough Mm -hmm. or at least maintaining enough the level that you're at to to achieve your goals if they're high performance goals. Gotcha. And what about the horses that you guys are looking for? What do you look for for a horse for vaulting? Well, for for our high performance especially, and you have to think about when they're cantering, mm-hmm. there's a harmony. And so the better the canter, the better the harmony for mm-hmm. the vaulter. So I usually look for horses that have some dressage training or they're – I look at the canter and it's a natural balanced canter. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, I'm going to work with something that's good to start with. Mm-hmm. And then we just take it slow. And, and like I said, Daniel said, we train all our young horses. He mm-hmm. helps me. And we basically, most of the trainings, we just move around them as much yeah. as possible, not staying in one place too long. Mm-hmm. So they get upset, but Usually with Daniel, he's moved somewhere else before they figured out he was back there mm-hmm. on the butt. And it just takes a lot of, with horses, repetition, yeah. kindness, not scaring them, mm-hmm. brings them all the way. And usually we we take the horses all the way unless um, unless something has scared them. Yeah. I think the horses are really good when you can build the trust in mm-hmm. what you're doing. Then they get very accepting, Mm -hmm. but the trust has to be there through the training. And that's what I do with Daniel. I can imagine that I'm I'm just trying to, it was a lot to take in for me today. It's the first time I've gotten to watch vaulting in action, but as a dressage rider and Carolyn, your background's in dressage Mm -hmm. as well. It seems like they parallel and almost go hand in hand. What's the, how do you train a horse for vaulting? Well, it is better to start with a quite a balanced horse. So for my, from the dressage perspective, I mm-hmm. would at least want beginning second level when mm-hmm. they start to develop self carriage mm-hmm. and start a little bit of early collection. So if they already have that, then I'm throwing a, a vaulter up there who's moving everywhere. Mm-hmm. And so they're already balanced. So it doesn't upset them too much because they're like, oh, wait a minute, he's going over there. But the horses are so balanced that they, mm-hmm. they're not really reacting. I think it's too long of a process if you don't have a horse already ridden to that kind of level. Yeah. Because if I took a young horse, I'd school it up to second level yes. before I started really its vaulting training. Okay. So now I'm going to throw a kicker at you guys. So with Retired Racehorse Radio, we work with the Thoroughbred Makeover Project. And that's one of, vaulting's one of the disciplines that they offer. They have nine months to take an next racehorse and bring them for vaulting. Now, obviously, they're not going to be ready to do anything at your level, Daniel. But what would a competitor want to look for within their horse as far as body type, you know, mental capability, if they're like, I want to take this horse to the makeover and compete in vaulting? Well, I would look for the natural balance mm-hmm. of the canter. And some racehorses have wonderful balance mm-hmm. in canters. 
And and then you want, I'd probably look for a little bit bigger boned Mm -hmm. horse and already, you know, fairly muscled. And then you could just do some little tests to see how mm-hmm. how they would accept mentally things. Yeah. Yes. And then I I grew up riding thoroughbreds, and mm-hmm. I invented in England, so we took ex staple steeplechase horses mm-hmm. and made them into good event horses. And so I love thoroughbreds. I think if a thoroughbred trusts you, you've got a good partner. You mm-hmm. don't need they have an energy, so you don't have to chase them. They mm-hmm. can settle into a r- lovely rhythm. Mm-hmm. and keep it so i'm all for finding a good thoroughbred i love that i love that and daniel what are your thoughts have you ever vaulted on a thoroughbred thoroughbred draft cross a long time ago there was a really nice horse that i vaulted on that was like that and uh, he was great to vault on mm-hmm. in general we we look for like carolyn said slightly bigger boned more mm-hmm. muscled horses mm-hmm. it's just um generally easier for both the horse and the vaulter mm-hmm. if the horse is a little bit of the bigger variety. Mm -hmm. Um, It's easier to balance on them, easier for them to balance a full-grown human Mm -hmm. on top of them. So, yeah, that's generally what we look for. Gotcha. And does age have anything to do with it, too, as opposed to a younger horse versus maybe a little older, like the war horses who are coming off the track? Um, Well, actually, we purchased and do purchase or older horses Mm -hmm. because if I've got a 16 year old and it's still got a lovely canter and we look after it and Mm -hmm. it's a good vaulting horse they can vault into the 20s you know after 20 we have to kind of think about Mm -hmm. you know retirement but this 2018 his horse at WEG his individual horse was 21 Awesome. Yeah. So, so it's a longer career as it's opposed a lot to longer some career. other disciplines. Yeah. Well, as long as you take care of them, of mm-hmm. course. You know, we're very careful about how much they do on a circle. So the mm-hmm. vaulters have to get very fit mm-hmm. off the horses. Yes, and then, absolutely. And then we, mm-hmm. you know, we're not, we don't overuse them at all. Mm-hmm. I'm very a proponent that we use them. If I see the mm-hmm. horse struggling at all, we have to take a break. If the quality of the canter degrades, mm-hmm. we take a break. So I think that it's a good sport for horses mm-hmm. to be in as long as they have, you know, some good pe- people training them and worrying about their health, just awesome. like every discipline, really. Wonderful. And then obviously we have Michelle here too. And Michelle, you put this clinic together, help put it together. You, you have an amazing club. Tell us a little bit about the club that you have in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Well, I was going to add about training horses. I don't mm-hmm. think you always have to have a canter horse right off the bat. And especially new people coming in that they have a thoroughbred that they get the vaulting tack mm-hmm. and they just get that, you know, they get the vaulting tack out and they started to walk and even the trot mm-hmm. that would be, you know, they're not always going to start at a canter. So, mm-hmm. um, so most clubs start at walk and trot. Um, that being said, I got started because my daughter loved the sport. She was three. She was riding and doing cartwheels in the pasture mm-hmm. and, the vaulting connection in Grand Rapids is where she started. She was doing gymnastics. And then last year we decided to pursue vaulting exclusively. Mm-hmm. And we needed to create a club that had the rigorous type of training necessary to go to the next mm-hmm. level. Cause only three hours or two hours a week. Um, anytime you want to pursue excellence, you're going to need to put it like Daniel said, like 15 hours. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what we've been doing. You know, we have, we actually, Daniel's coaching through a virtual vaulting program. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, the kids have two video sessions a month where mm-hmm. we online stream him actually coaching them. So we use Facebook Messenger and video chat that in. And then we practice Tuesday, Thursday. We go to the gym, gymnastics mm-hmm. gym, a couple Fridays a month. And then every other Saturday and every Sunday, we come to Cedar Lodge mm-hmm. to use their canter horses. Because um, I have horses in training that are not quite ready. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty rigorous. Um and we're actually going to be going with Carolyn and the Pacific Coast Vaulters over to France for our first international competition. That's exciting. And so these these kids, I've seen vaulting transforms a lot their lives in ways. It's an amazing sport because of the connections that mm-hmm. you make, um, not just in the local area, but around the, the yeah. world. Um, we're in a region called Region 10. Mm-hmm. So I'm the president of this region. And so I put these clubs, these, these clinics together, and the clubs are really, really uh, friendly, and mm-hmm. we do a lot together. And so, again, we'll go to competitions and we share horses. Mm-hmm. So if I can't bring horses, I come and use someone else's horses. Um, like, for example, my kids are vaulting on the this club's horses. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think any other horse sport has that type of provision or that, yeah. that type of camaraderie uh, through different clubs. Mm-hmm. So. 
Um, and, and all these kids are friends. And so again, mm-hmm. I feel like that's something Walting is offering. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm hooked. That's you know? awesome. Now, do you, is vaulting one of those things that's better to start when you're younger or, you know, I'm 28 years old and I feel like I'm inspired to go to the gym and try a little harder now. If I wanted to get involved, is it too late for me? No, I don't think so. Because we have, we have vaulters that uh, are 66, 68. We have a lady in Missouri. Oh, wow. She's vaulting. I think if you're a rider and you want to be better, become a better rider, that vaulting could help you do that. And so really, it kind of allows an opportunity. And even if you started out a little later and you wanted to compete, you know, nationally and get into the competitions and, and just, you know, pursue it to, you know, obviously, not, you're not as going to be as fit mm-hmm. as a, a 20-year-old, right? Yeah. And as you get older, you, your body kind of starts falling apart, right? Mm-hmm. But it's certainly something you could get into and you could become very competitive, but you also would see the corresponding improvement in your writing. That's awesome. That's awesome. Have you guys seen that as well as you I've have older people? I've seen both ends. I've seen vaulters who have never been writers who have come up through vaulting and then pursued a writing career and mm-hmm. been amazing writers because they already have the balance. They have the independent seat. They know how to fall. Mm-hmm. Um, they can get themselves off a horse and out Mm -hmm. of trouble at any time. And so they become very natural riders. And then I've had people from riding who then come to vaulting and they already have the harmony. So Mm -hmm. then they can move up the levels a little faster or the gates faster Mm -hmm. because they've had the harmony. And I think Daniel started at 15. So he wasn't, you know, a a young young kid starting. Mm -hmm. No, it's definitely possible. M- most kids I know have started vaulting when they were a bit younger. Probably the average age, if I were to guess, would be around seven, eight, nine to start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes younger, sometimes a little older. We have some two-year-olds, um, and three-year-olds. Yeah, some two- wow. and three-year-olds, some toddlers. It's oh like my god, a- I was not that coordinated as a two-year-old. <laughs> just break it down. I like fell through yeah. a floor at my house. Mm-hmm. Like our, our, two- <laughs> our, our two-year-old is in the canter. Of course, oh we put a vaulter on with them, um, but they're actually getting the experience of the canter. Oh. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's definitely possible. Um, pretty much whatever your age is and mm-hmm. um, just, yeah, it depends on what your goals are. And I think with hard work that many things are possible, even That's if awesome. you're starting later mm-hmm. in age, like I did, I started at 15, I'm mm-hmm. only in my mid twenties now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or if you start, um, a lot younger than gotcha. you have time. And, yeah. I think a lot of riding programs would really benefit from having a vaulting for riders, even if they mm-hmm. weren't pursuing a very competitive it competitively just because I, I just know that even the jumping team at our barn in Grand Rapids has been asking us to teach mm-hmm. them vaulting. And yeah. so the other day I came out and saw them actually practicing vaulting all in their hunter seat mm-hmm. saddles. And I'm like, what are you guys doing without the handles? But I think it is, um, again, something that riders would probably find really beneficial. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that might be the angle that vaulting takes to kind of grow as a sport. Because so I think once they try it and they realize This is really hard. Yeah. This takes a lot of fitness. And this is a horse sport. Mm -hmm. This is not just doing gymnastics on apparatus. That horse is an athlete that you train as your partner. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's what makes it so much better than gymnastics. Absolutely. There was definitely a lot of training on both ends for horse and rider and the coaches too. It's it was really beautiful to watch. Like I was very moved watching today and I want to try a little bit harder. Friday, she was here Friday and she's Monday for horse training. Of oh. course, compared yeah, to the right in and and oh, wow. mm-hmm. so, on top of that. Yeah. So I think a, it's just, you know, I, I've been in this since 1995, I think. And what to me keeps it in it, it I do love horses, mm-hmm. loved them all my life, but they, you know, when you work with them all the time, it is a job. So <laughs> you forget that you really like working with them sometimes, <laughs> but what, really has kept me in the sport is I have seen so many people come through a vaulting program and been just brilliant, beautiful human beings at the end of it, accomplished, confident, getting into good schools because Mm -hmm. the physical exercise also helps the mental Mm -hmm. exercise. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they have to work with other people and with a horse and they've got to communicate. Mm -hmm. And it's just, to me, it's a wonderful way to bring children up and have wonderful adults at the end of it. 
I love that. So if someone was interested in getting involved in vaulting or finding a clinic, what do you suggest that or where they, can they look for that? I would direct them to the American Vaulting Association website mm -hmm. and Facebook page. Like and follow it. We have fan memberships that mm -hmm. they wanted to get a fan membership that would keep them updated on everything that's going on with the AVA. And then their specific location, they can find out what region they're in. And then okay. each region has a supervisor. And then that supervisor you could contact and they would put you in touch with the local club. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in Region 10, which is Michigan, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Kentucky, I think West Virginia. That's mm -hmm. all. You know, then there's clubs and we find out, hey, I want to I want to try vaulting. Then you can come mm -hmm. to the club and try it. Or we also have a surf single that we can lease out. And okay. we do a 90 day lease. And we teach you how to, you know, somebody comes and we teach you how to tack up. And then we go out and we support it because mm -hmm. we really do want to grow vaulting. Because, I mean, we all are pretty much, it's just a great sport. And I think we're all pretty hooked and we're all really passionate about it. I agree. I, I want to try it now. Like I was talking to Amy. I was like, I want to set up a lesson. <laughs> I can tell you that back when, I mean, I was an elite gymnast and that was my background. And um, so Maria was writing and I, when I was asked if she wanted to vault, I kind of dismissed it as mm -hmm. a circus. I, I, I legitimately said, no, no, that's really not for her. And, but, you know, she insisted and it was only one time a week, but I had her in a rigorous gymnastics program and she mm -hmm. loved gymnastics. Well, if you would tell me today that now I have well, two oh, two horses. I never, I'm not a horse person, just so you know. <laughs> I just got sucked into this. I now own two horses. I'm training it for vaulting. I'm the president of Region 10. I'm the VP of development for the American Vaulting Association. And I have a vaulting club that I'm spending 25 hours plus a week training on top mm -hmm. of my full-time job. I would have told you that, no, it's, that will never happen. Mm -hmm. But, you know, once you get involved, you get involved. And you mm -hmm. really, too, like Carolyn said, you see it transform people's lives. But... It's just an incredible sport. Yeah. It's on one level, it's an incredible sport. It takes a ton of athleticism and, and, and the teamwork across the country, all the vaulters, even when we're competing, there's some type of camaraderie that is mm -hmm. really unique and you don't see it in gymnastics. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen it in any sport. I'm not a horse person. I didn't come from a horse background, but I know that this is something I heard is exquisitely different because you can't go to a national competition and say, we're competing against each other, but we're going to use your horse. Yeah. So again, that's um, a different type of situation. I love it. I think that's a great note to end on because you really captured everything about it and just my short time here. And thank you guys so much for letting me sit in and watch everything you do. And I'm excited to learn more. Um, if people want to ask you guys questions, Michelle, where can people find you? Well, I have a Facebook page for Great uh, Lakes Equestrian Vaulting. I'm also on the American Vaulting Association. You, know, you can reach me through my email there, vpdevelopment mm -hmm. at AmericanVaulting.org. Um, same with Carolyn. You have your... Yeah, I'm a VP of Education at the American Vaulting Association. And then they could find me on the Pacific Coast Vaulting website, mm -hmm. which is our, our home club. Gotcha. And Daniel? Same as what Carolyn said. You can find me on the Pacific Coast Vaulting Facebook page or website. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much and get warm because I know Michigan winter is a huge difference in California winter. <laughs> thank you thank very you. much. Thanks, guys. Did you know that Smarty Jones sired a young event horse winner or that a Medaglia del Oro son competed in second level at U.S. Dressage Finals? Find out how all of your favorite sires and bloodlines perform in second careers through the Retired Racehorse Project's interactive thoroughbred sport tracker. The Internet's only user-driven database tracking thoroughbreds and second careers has thousands of entries that can be searched by sire, grandsire or dam sire, as well as by discipline. With a free RRP online user account, you can enter your own thoroughbreds information to help the database grow. Tap TB Sport Tracker in the menu at retiredracehorseproject.org and learn more today. And from the back of the pack on the outside, commanding curve is taken second, but California Chrome shines right in the dead track. And now it's time for the New Vocations Winner's Circle Adoptable Horse of the Week. I'm so happy to have on the show once again, Leandra from New Vocations. Hey, girl. Tell us a little bit about this tall drink of water named Flying Arrow. Yep. 
flying arrow who we call Robin as he was inspired by the Robin Hood name is not a horse you can easily miss in the barn. He has just that striking look and stands at 16 too. So just that all around presence in the stall, out of the stall, in the field, it doesn't really matter where he is. He's one that you'll notice right away. So like I said, at 16 too, he comes to us without any previous soundness history so retired without any known injuries has stayed sound and training with us and is just absolutely the icon of what you would imagine a sport horse to be he's uphill has a really fluid movement has three nice gates is really adjustable and is a horse who's just really willing to please and learn so there's just not much to complain about with him all around. No, he is drop dead gorgeous. He's a very, very tall, perfectly. I mean, his conformation is amazing. Ginormous Bay thoroughbred gelding, you know, 2014 model flying arrow and has tap it is his sire, which do you get any more athletic than a horse by tap it? I don't think so. No. And w- no. watching you ride him, he just looks amazing. He just floats around. He has these incredibly long legs and like we've been working on putting rounding him out as as many do when they're going from more of the race fit body to a sport horse body. And he, he's a great eater, but with those long, long legs, he covers ground and it's nice because he has that stretch to him, but it's so easily stretches that it it just feels seamless. Yeah. He's really lovely. We're just walking across water. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he's very smooth and he's RRP eligible. So if you have an entry to the makeover, you are going to want to jump aboard on Flying Arrow and take him. Gosh, I mean, he looks like he looks like he'd be an event horse, but also he's got that classic hunter look as well. Yes. Yep. Very, very classy look to him. Well, where can people go to find him and to fill out an application about him? Our website, horseadoption.com, has both his profile where you can look at his video, see his pictures and all his information. And then if you are not already an approved adopter, you can apply right through our website at horseadoption.com. And you guys go do it because he's not going to stay around long. He is just classy looking. So, uh, Leandra, thank you so much. What uh, I do know, we have an event coming up at Rolex, uh, well, Land Rover, to come and visit you guys. What is going on for that? Absolutely. We have our open barn and barbecue coming up in April, same time, uh, Land Rover, as you mentioned. So it's an opportunity for people to come into our barn and check everything out. So whereas we usually reserve appointment slot, slots for people who are approved doctors and, you know, just looking at specific courses, this is where you can listen to music, some food and drink. We have a really cool clinic every year where you can see me ride as well as my assistant. We will we'll hop on some of the new vocation horses and have some interesting people come tell you about their confirmation and we'll do some little work in the ring. And then we actually even have some big names like Rosina Propnik's going to come in and hopefully bring her horse to show on the other side after working with her OTTB for a little bit longer, maybe strut herself a little bit in the ring for us. So there'll be lots to see um, if you're in the area during that time, it's definitely worth coming to. It's a lot of fun and something that we really look forward to. Every it year. is. It was a lot of fun last year and we will definitely be there, Joy, and I will be there again this year. And again, go to horseadoption.com to check out Flying Arrow or I love it. Robin, Robin of the Hood. Thanks, Leandra. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You can find our show notes and links to today's guest on the website at retiredracehorseradio.com. Like us on Facebook and Instagram. Search for Retired Racehorse Radio. Also, maybe go give us a review. You can email Jamie at jamie at horseradionetwork.com. 
or email me at joy at horseradionetwork.com or follow me on Instagram at joy H equestrian. Also make sure to follow us on Instagram because I put special posts there that I don't put on the Facebook thing to interact with everyone. So if you want some good stuff, go to our Instagram page. Uh, thanks so much to our sponsors, Kentucky Performance Products and Cashel. And don't forget to check out all the other shows on Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Remember to set your goals high and love to learn from every ride. And spay, neuter, and geld. Mwah. Bye, guys. Bye.